working with Barry Sr. and Jr. and all the staff at uh, Jonathan Green. It's, it's nice to know that, that who you're dealing with, who owns the company, if there's an issue or a question we ha need to be, have answered, I have both Barry's phone numbers in my cell phone and, I, and they pick up the phone all the time and, uh, and answer questions and, and if we need to place an order or if we have questions about some crazy idea we want to try, maybe they already have an answer to it and, uh, and they're, they're right there on the, with, you know, with the phone call away. That means a lot to us. And um, it's, uh, it's nice to know that they stand behind their product as well as they do. And again, if we need anything, we can go right to the source. The thing about the Black Beauty, I mean, the seed was actually, I believe, derived from out in the desert. Um, I have grown it here. We usually have pots. We haven't got to it yet this year. But I grew some Black Beauty. And about, about two months when I pulled it out of the pot, the roots were wrapped around the inside of the whole thing. I could not, you could not, you could barely see dirt from the pot because it was all roots. It was amazing. Reason we've gone to the Black Beauty is due to the restraints put on by towns in uh, states on reduction of fertilizer and water use. Uh, the big thing was we had planted some tall fescue about five years ago. And about six, seven months after we had planted that, I got a phone call from our distributor on Nantucket. He was in a quandary because he was told that they were thinking about banning bluegrass sod from the island. The reason being a private uh, school teacher or a science teacher had taken a bag of fertilizer, dumped five gallons of water on it, and then pointed at the kids and told them, this is what your parents' fancy bluegrass lawn is doing to the water here on Nantucket. When he called me, I told him, well, we have an alternative solution for you. We have a grass that'll take 30 to 50% water in uh, fertilizer, so there's an alternative. In that time since we've uh, done that, he's seen his sales change from truckloads of bluegrass to now truckloads of Jonathan Green's Black Beauty. Most people cannot even tell that there's, they think it's bluegrass. It's that, it's that close. But the characteristics are there of, of the tall fescue. I'm actually new to uh, the barn area here at Mahoney's, um, but in the, the short time I've been here this spring, I get a lot of response from people that come in. Um, they've had a very good experience with uh, Jonathan Green products in the past, um, and generally they're coming back for more. It's, it's uh, worked for them well. They may have family or friends that come in. They've heard good things about Jonathan Green, and so they come back to um, to green up their lawn, whether it be with the fertilizers or, or to get a good uh, grass seed to put on their lawn. Um, actually, I work another job um, with a, uh, a man who happens to be a landscaper, and when I mentioned that I work in Mahoney's, he asked if we carried the Jonathan Green product, and that was, he was excited that we did because he uses the Black Beauty on his lawns. Four years ago, we started growing turf-type tall fescue uh, for, for sale and uh, we used a competitor's product and it grew very nicely and we harvested it and we sold it and our customers enjoyed it. Uh, but then we tried Jonathan Green's Black Beauty uh, and it was clear that that was a better product. The leaf texture was finer and it stayed finer throughout the entire course of its, of its life uh, here on the farm and uh, our customers definitely enjoyed the uh, Jonathan Green's Black Beauty uh, better than the the competitors and uh, at that point we switched over to Jonathan Green and our sales have uh, gone from what basically zero four years ago to it's now 50 percent of our total sales for Sodco uh, is Jonathan Green's Black Beauty. It's just been a really really tremendous relationship they're always there for us uh, they come out they'll do seminars for us uh, Barry showed up the chairman of the company uh, about two weeks ago on a Saturday and I was short a person. He stayed here all day and just helped sell product and tell people about the product. Uh, that was really nice. You know, we're a family business, they are, and, and, and they treat us like a family. Like a family. Like a family. When we go back in time and think about the past, I suppose we are trying to recover something, possibly some idea that survives now only as a fragment of lost words or an elusive rhythm. Possibly some idea about ourselves 
that has been almost lost in the confusion and disorder of daily existence. Sometimes we all feel that if we could go back to a certain starting point and go over everything slowly, we could find the thing we've missed. Jonathan Green's ancestors lived for centuries in the West Riding of Yorkshire. The Green family traces back to an Edmund Green, born in 1556 in Horton in Ribblesdale. Jonathan Green's grandfather was Richard Green, who was born in 1776 at the family home, the Lum, near Giggleswick. His firstborn son, Thomas, born in 1806, was a weaver and later the innkeeper at Lister's Arms in Malham and the Victoria Inn in Kirkby Malham. Thomas Green was the father of Jonathan Green. Each of us is the sum of many things, but there is no way to count. Each life is a window into past time, a lost lane end into a lost world. Jonathan Green's ancestors came from such towns as Horton in Ribblesdale, Rathmel, Giggleswick, and Mirbeck. They were farmers, white limers, slaters, and innkeepers. Jonathan Green was the first son of Thomas and Elizabeth Betty Green. He was born on December 4, 1836, in the small, picturesque village of Malham. Malham is situated in a valley surrounded by the high, windswept moorland of West Yorkshire. The village is divided into East and West Malham by the Malham Beck, the River Air. Time seems to have passed gently by as this remote village has remained remarkably unchanged over nearly the past two centuries. On New Year's Day, the 1st of January, 1837, Thomas and Betty walked the mile and one half from Malham to St. Michael's Church at Kirkby Malham, where Jonathan was baptized by the curate Joshua Waltham. His life seemed touched by a magic that lit many lives through many generations. His father was a weaver and worked in the water-powered cotton mill at Skagill, which was built on the Malham Beck between the villages of Malham and Hanleth near Kirkby Malham. There is no record of Jonathan's early school life, but he would have started at the church school in 1842 at the age of five. By the age of 12, most children left school and started work on a farm or in the cotton mill. In 1851, at the age of 14, Jonathan left his home at the Victoria Inn in Kirkby Malham. He moved in with his cousins, the Parker family, who were farmers in the nearby town of Giggleswick. Giggleswick is six miles from Kirkby Malham over the Scusthorpe High Moor. Today, there is still only a narrow footpath over the hauntingly beautiful High Moorland to Giggleswick. After Jonathan Green left school, we find him working on a farm in the small village of Otterburn, about four miles south of Kirkby Malham. It was here that he met Betsy Hogg, who was a domestic servant at the farm. Betsy came from Scaleby in the county of Cumberland, not far from the English border with Scotland. She was born on July 14, 1838, to Thomas and Anne Hogg. Thomas Hogg was a tailor. On January 26, 1859, when Jonathan was 22 years old, he married the 20-year-old Betsy Hogg in the registrar's office in the West Yorkshire town of Settle. Shortly after their marriage, they moved to Salford, near Manchester. They took lodgings at 7 Bolton Road in the house of Joseph Schulz, a stonemason. Jonathan, with a background of farming, became a gardener, tending the gardens of the numerous prosperous industrialists of Salford. Although we all feel a certain communion with the earth, particularly in such a wild, beautiful place, it must be remembered that these regions were becoming increasingly dependent on the money economy of the cities. These were places where actual cash was scarce. By 1871, we find Jonathan and his wife Betsy and their five children living in a rented terrace house at 74 Whit Lane, Salford. Jonathan had taken a position, as a clerk, in a cotton bleach and dye works. During this period, tragedy struck the family, and on the 22nd of March, 1879, at 102 Whit Lane, Pendleton, Betsy died. She was nearly 41 years of age. She was laid to rest on the 27th of March, 1879, 
in the churchyard at St. Thomas's, Salford, not far from Whit Lane. When Betsy died, she left five children, three girls, Mary Ann, Bessie, and Charlotte, and two sons, John and Hubert. Two other children had died in infancy. Jonathan and his family remained in Salford for some years, but he eventually moved his family about twenty miles away to the town of Chorley in Lancashire. Here he rented a small terrace house at 42 Harrison Road. After arriving in Chorley, he worked for a time in a cotton dye works, an industry he had become fully familiar with over the years. Here, in Chorley, during the 1880s, he began a new life and a new business, one not centered on the manufacturing trades, but on growing turf grass. Chorley at that time was a small manufacturing town with a population of about 20,000. The town contained a dozen large cotton mills, which normally operated 12 hours daily from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. During these years, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, one of the few sources of recreation available to working men was bowling on the green. Just about every town had bowling greens. Men formed bowling clubs and during the long spring and summer evenings would enjoy this form of recreation. It is doubtful whether anyone living today can understand how life was lived in the late 19th century in Northern Europe. It was the sum of old cities with great factories, melancholy rows of red brick houses, people awakening to the sounds of factory whistles and clogs on cobblestones. All these images and many more can surely awaken emotions of empathy in all of us. It was against this gray industrial background that a young widower began a career destined to restore some natural beauty into people's lives. Jonathan Green began constructing bowling greens in Chorley and surrounding towns. He experimented with different grasses and combinations of grasses in an attempt to improve the quality of bowling green turf. On Sunday the 6th of April in the early spring of 1919 at the age of 81, Jonathan Green died in the Union Hospital on Eves Lane, Chorley, Lancashire. He was taken to Salford where he was laid to rest in St. Thomas's churchyard beside his beloved wife, Betsy. As you think about his life, as you picture in your mind the wild, beautiful, bleak moorland from which he came, as you think of the small towns with their stone-built houses, the green, sloping, sheep-dotted fields, you have the feeling that if you searched harder, you might still find the old man walking along the road in the enchanted light of evening. Jonathan Green's youngest son, Hubert, was born on March 5, 1871, at 74 Whit Lane, Salford, England. At the age of 12, he was apprenticed to a butcher. This meant that he lived with the butcher's family for seven years. During this time, he was taught how to slaughter animals and sell meat. It meant working in the slaughterhouse and the retail store, with no salary. The training he received was considered sufficient compensation. Hubert was married at the age of 22, in 1893, to Ada Kendall from New Barnes in Cumberland County, north of Liverpool. They had met on a day's holiday to Blackpool. His business really prospered because in 1902 he owned two trotting horses named Red Star and Ivy Green. He had leased a 12-acre field at the corner of Harrison Road and Pall Mall. There was a barn and a stable on the property. Here he kept his horses, along with about a dozen steers for slaughtering. The steers were bought at Birkenhead, near Liverpool, to where they had been imported from the Argentine. Hubert was a born businessman. In 1903, Hubert purchased a public house at 29 Bolton Street, Chorley, called the Albion, with profits from the sale of the butcher shop. The Albion was a busy, glorified pub. This young man, who had begun life as an apprentice to a butcher, began to turn his eyes westward towards America, where he imagined his business skills would enjoy a brighter, wider playing field. A day finally came when he stood for the last time on Bolton Street. He probably already knew that his former life was behind him. Like a man standing on a hill above the town he has left, and yet he knows he can't go back. 
In 1907, Hubert sailed for America, leaving his wife and children behind, with the plan to bring them to America once he had become established. One can only wonder at his thoughts as he stood on the deck of the steamship in Liverpool Harbor and watched his wife and children fade from view. This was the last time he ever saw England. Hubert arrived in America when he was 36 years old. He walked through the streets of this new bustling land, far from the people he loved. He lived soberly and industriously, saving his money in order to bring his wife and children to the United States. After five years of hard work, he accomplished his goal. Before long, he established his own business, a cash meat market, as he called it. Soon, he was prospering again. With his enormous drive and ambition, one can only wonder at what he could have become if he had the educational advantages that we take for granted today. He died at the comparatively young age of 64. However, Hubert left something that had not died, a passion to succeed. In the great span of years through which the history of a family develops, few were more significant than 1897. In that year, Hubert and Ada had their second son, whom they christened Jack. This young man, born in the waning years of the 19th century, was destined to exert a powerful influence within the family through most of the 20th century. In 1912, Jack, then 15 years old, sailed for America with his brother Charles. His mother and the rest of the family came to the United States in the following year. While a night student at New York University, Jack entered a nationwide contest for the best essay on advertising by a beginner, run by the Advertising Club of the City of New York. A total of 442 essays were submitted. He won first prize, a trip to London to attend a convention of the Associated Advertising Clubs of the World. After his initial success, opportunities came into his life. During the late 20s and 30s, he held increasingly responsible positions in the advertising business. However, the Great Depression soon darkened the economic landscape across the United States and around the world. Years of hard-won advances and difficult times followed his early successes. However, Jack's life successfully transversed almost the entire length of the 20th century, characterized by a powerful combination of personal drive and promotional skill. At the age of 60, at a time when most men are close to retirement, Jack founded a turf seed business. He named this business Jonathan Green and Sons. He felt that he wanted, more than anything in the world, to continue the work begun so long ago by his grandfather, Jonathan. He became a seedsman. His long apprenticeship was over. This has been the story of a dream after all. Jonathan, Hubert, and Jack were all dreamers. They possessed some common drive, which guided them to create a better future for themselves. If they didn't always succeed, their efforts to transcend the limitations of their circumstances gave their descendants a glimpse of the larger arena that lay ahead. The early years at Jonathan Green were the creation of Jack Green Sr. His knowledge, insight, and wisdom shaped and sustained the company. The realities inherent in building on the dreams of the past never clouded his vision. He seemed to be impervious to the disappointments of everyday existence. Before long, the company was growing as his sons joined him in the business. During these years, Jonathan Green became a major supplier to the professional market, sod growers, landscapers, and lawn services. Steadily, the firm reached out to new markets, continuing the pattern of growth with quality. During the 80s, Jonathan Green Incorporated established a West Coast production and research company and named it Cascade International Seed Company. Many patented turf grasses have been developed in recent years at Cascade. This ambitious undertaking has increased Jonathan Green's competitiveness. At the same time, Cascade develops markets for turf seed around the world. A complete range of Jonathan Green grass seed and turf products is now being sold in thousands of independent garden centers, hardware stores, and home centers. They are using the same quality turf seed that they supply to the professionals for these independent retailers. 
This small history of the Green family is really done by way of an introduction to a larger story, that of the modern company, Jonathan Green Incorporated. It is certain that the family that arose from the rural countryside of West Yorkshire had no idea of what the future would bring. Sometimes in modern life, we take for granted things that we should probably question. The intensity of the lives that have played out in this little story actually show a strength of self-sufficiency and moral character. They figure things out and did things themselves in order to succeed. As an endless dream, a family business goes on, each new generation setting out guided by the spirit of the past, dedicated through long days to the success of the enterprise. Finally, destined to build on foundations laid generations ago.